coming up on this episode of Inside the Epicenter. A biblical theology on the nation and the people of Israel, both the covenant promise that God made to them to have the land and for the people that God has a plan for themselves. Why are these people so important to Joel Rosenberg and why should they be important to us? Welcome to Inside the Epicenter with Joel Rosenberg, a podcast of the Joshua Fund, a ministry dedicated to blessing Israel and her neighbors in the name of Jesus. I'm Carl Muller, Executive Director of the Joshua Fund. And today, we're wrapping up our foundational five-part series titled Critical Issues Facing the Epicenter. Previously, we've explored topics like, are the Jews the chosen people? Were the Jews given the promised land? Why does the world hate Israel? And does God love Israel's neighbors? We're closing out this series by answering this question. How can the church bless Israel and her neighbors? I know you'll want to know the answer to that. The answer to this question is the very foundation of who we are at the Joshua Fund. So we hope you enjoy this message from our founder, Joel Rosenberg. You sort of shine in this area. You really like a Q&A kind of a format, don't you? You feel comfortable getting kind of direct questions. I do because I find that every time I say something, it generates an enormous amount of questions. I hope that I'm answering some when I speak, but I think this is an area that people sense there's more to be understood. And they, I think there's not enough credible voices. I'm not saying that I'm the most, but, uh, but I think I'm glad to be one of the voices that are saying God loves both the Jews and the Muslims. That's a very unique message that you brought. Tonight, though we're going to answer questions, I know what's on your heart, is to talk about how the church can bless Israel and her neighbors, our part in it. This was part of a whole series. Uh, as we talked last night and we showed up on the screen, the series is Critical Issues Facing the People of the Epicenter. And as I was listening to all the messages, Joel, it dawned on me that what you are doing for us is formulating a theology of Israel, a biblical theology on the nation and the people of Israel, both the covenant promise that God made to them to have the land and for the people that God has a plan for themselves. Why are these people so important to Joel Rosenberg, and why should they be important to us? Well, they're important to me personally because I'm a Rosenberg. So if you're Jewish, now now, let's be clear, uh, I'm Jewish on my father's side. Uh, My father was an Orthodox Jew, raised in Brooklyn. Uh, His family escaped out of Russia as Orthodox Jews in 1907. They escaped in a hay wagon that uh, was crossing the border out of anti-Semitic, czarist, fascist Russia. Soldiers plunged their swords into the hay to see if anyone was in there. By God's grace, no one was injured. Uh, No one sneezed. None of the kids, of which there were quite a few actually in that hay wagon, said, are we there yet? (laughs) I got to go to the bathroom. And having gotten out of anti-Semitic, fascist, czarist Russia, they cleared out of Russia and they, theoretically, they could have said, great, we're out, let's settle in Poland or Germany, or Austria, where many Russian Jews fled to and thought, now we're safe. But the Lord kept moving them, and they didn't know the Lord personally. But I believe the Holy Spirit moved them across Europe, got them to Ellis Island, and like any good Jewish family, they set up shop in Brooklyn, which is where my father was raised. And now my mom's side is uh, daughters of the American Revolution, English, Methodist, WASP. So a very... Annie Hall marriage, as it were. I mean, literally my Jewish grandmother offered to buy the engagement ring back from my father at a profit to him to not marry the shiksa, the the non-Jewish girl, right? And uh, now if you understand that Jews don't like to play retail, then paying over retail to your own son, that meant she didn't really want him to marry the woman that would become my mother. But, so this was personal for me. I mean, I see God's love for Jews. Amen. And Gentiles. And I see how God has drawn both my parents eventually into the kingdom, came to faith in Jesus Christ in in 1973. You know, eventually I did as well. So I took my first trip to Israel in 1987. I was a junior at Syracuse University. 
and I got an opportunity to spend a semester abroad, about six months, in Israel at Tel Aviv University. And it was game changing for me. I mean, I just, I was electrified by everything. I was the only believer on the entire campus, which was challenging, but it was also exciting because everyone kept saying, isn't your name Rosenberg? <laughs> yeah. But don't you believe in Jesus? Yeah. Well, A, why are you here? And B, how is that possible? And that was kind of exciting. <laughs> but just being there, I just knew in a way that I didn't know just by reading the Bible, this is the center of history. It was at the beginning and it will be at the end. And I just sensed the Lord saying, in some way, I'm supposed to be a part of it. Not at the center of history, but understanding the people there and caring for them in some way. Uh, Joel, as I was listening to you this morning and uh, last night, what struck me is that you approach prophecy differently. Now, I want to explain that. It's not just academic to you. It's not just arm's length. It's not just about fitting the chronology or charts. It's personal to you on a level. And partly you've explained why. You are Jewish. You are a Rosenberg. And um, I think there's a part of you, as this, I, especially as I saw some emotion coming out in that last service today when you're talking about God's love, not just for the Jews, but for her Arab neighbors as well, is that like Paul the Apostle, you feel this kindred Paul, and as Paul said, I could even wish myself accursed from Christ for my brethren's sake. So That's a guy who believed in eternal security. Yes, exactly really right. So give us a little bit of your feeling, because I think it kind of goes into what you wanted to say to us tonight for a few minutes about our part in reaching Israel. But for you, it's prophecy has a goal. I see it in your life as a motivator to have you do what you do in Israel and with the territories in Israel and the Arab nations around Israel. So prophecy is a motivator to get Christians to act. Is that how you'd see it? Uh, it is, and it's interesting. I'm not sure a lot of people have you know, perceived it quite that way. I, I, because for, I think for some, prophecy is an end unto itself. And so it becomes uh, you know, fascinating in its own right. It doesn't necessarily become an application to a, a sort of a so what moment. Okay, it's, yeah, that's all interesting. Jesus coming back and now you've got all the charts and graphs, but so what? Well, why, right. why does that make a difference? Um, you know, I come from a Campus Crusade experience at Syracuse University. That's where I met my wife in Campus Crusade for Christ, where the passion was go and make disciples of all nations. Because yes, Jesus is coming. Therefore, we better do something about it. Like obey Jesus. I go to a church in Washington, D.C. where my pastor is from a Jewish background himself and he he loves to you know teach his way through the scriptures but then about halfway through the sermon he'll he'll say all right we're going to pick up on the rest of the passage next week but now we need to ask the important question so what and so for me yes the fact that we have so many indications that we're getting close closer to the return of Jesus Christ tells me therefore we better do things that are in keeping with what the lord has called us to do historically you know the church has been drawn to the big places, you know, we're gonna go reach China with the love of Jesus and India and Brazil and Africa, all important, critical, you know, but I think we, since we talked about it, we see that the church has really had mostly, not exclusively, but mostly a deeply flawed theology towards Jews. And since Israel didn't exist, that wasn't even part of the equation. Like how do we bless Israel? It, there was no way to bless Israel, but bless the Jews, I mean, you know, from Martin Luther on, there were a lot of people that just said, why would you do that? In fact, they went the other direction and somehow got out of this text that Jews were cursed. And uh, I think I said in one of the services, you know, the Apostle Paul really gives us a pretty clear indication in Romans that the Gentile church is supposed to, in part, provoke the Jews to jealousy. I think the Gentile church has done a pretty good job in the first part of that thought you know, the provoking of the Jews has been very effective, I, I would say, historically. Not so much to jealousy. So for me, when I see, number one, my own family coming to faith, knowing historically that with all the things that were against us as Jews, and how few Jews have come to faith in Jesus historically, that the fact that I know, that my father knows, that my children know, and that my Gentile wife and my Gentile mother know, that's an important piece that I just can't say, well, 
move on with my, oh good, check that off, move on with the rest of my life. That's important and I just sense this, uh, burden might be too strong a word, but I'm compelled to say, how do I go be a blessing to others? Mm -hmm. And Lord, show me what that means. What, what does it mean to be a blessing? But I should probably also say that I didn't even know I was Jewish till I was in the fifth grade. I know that it sounds funny, a name like Joel Rosenberg. I mean, how dumb do you have to be not to know that you're Jewish? But my father never told me. And my mother never told me. And it came out that one day he was teaching a sixth grade Sunday school class and I was in fifth grade and he decided to have a Passover Seder. And uh, he came home one day and said, hey, we're gonna have a Passover Seder next week in our class. I said, a what? He said, you know, the thing you do to celebrate Passover. I'm like, okay. And I said, what does that mean? So he explained what, it, what you do. I said, how would you know how to do that? He said, cause I'm Jewish. I said, you're Jewish? Does that mean I'm Jewish? How could this never come up? <laughs> and, you know, I know that sounds funny, and it is, but two thoughts out of that. One, as I tell that story around the country from time to time when I tell my testimony, I'm amazed how many people come up and say, I didn't know I was Jewish until, you know, whenever. Did you know that Secretary of State Madeleine Albright in the Clinton administration didn't know she was Jewish until the U.S. Diplomatic Security Service did a background check on her and say, Madam Secretary, uh, just so you know, you're clear, we're, you're good to go, you're also Jewish. I'm what? <laughs> uh, Senator George Allen of Virginia, until he was in a political campaign, didn't know he was Jewish until a reporter figured it out. Now, I was a little suspicious when Senator Hillary Clinton was running for Senate in New York and she discovered she was Jewish, but I'm just saying, it's possible. <laughs> that seemed convenient, but I'm just saying. I'm, so my point is, apparently there's a lot of people from whom their parents or grandparents often hid that to protect them. The other part for me was once I discovered, hey, this is important, isn't it? Then it became a real exciting thing on the one hand and also a, all right, Lord, show me, I, I know this is un not quite unique in history, but it's rare, so how do I live differently? Okay, so I'm going to ask Joel another question. Perhaps you have questions too, because I've talked to some of you or you've showed me slips of paper. So you'll have the chance to do that. And are they going to line up right here? So you're going to be able to come right down the center aisle and these pastors here have microphones so you can get ready for your questions as I ask you this question. You said something today that sparked some interest with me. You said radical Islam threatens Israel with annihilation. Replacement theology threatens Israel with delegitimization. You gave some examples of Martin Luther and others who have been anti-Semitic. And it dawned on me that for many of people in church history, without painting specifics, they have interpreted the scripture spiritually rather than literally. And so the Alexandrian church fathers years ago had that hermeneutic or way of interpreting the Bible. So Joel, help us. What's the best hermeneutic? What's the best approach of the scripture when it comes to reading it and interpreting it? Well, that's like a whole doctoral dissertation type question. Um, there's a couple ways to answer it. I guess the first thought I would have is with regards to replacement theology historically. Look, I'm sympathetic to church fathers who after 500 years of no Israel, no prospect of Israel, thought, I don't know, a thousand years go by, 1500 years go by, 1900 years go by. You know, y you can understand people going, okay, we're trying to take that literally, but the rebirth of the state of Israel, Jews coming back to the land, it's not gonna happen. So we must be misreading it. I I'm sympathetic to that, I understand that. But, you know, it turns out that they were wrong, that, that God really literally meant it. He just meant it's gonna be a long time. So that's first thought. So now I think we should be gentle and loving to our, those who still hold to it and help work their way out of it. That's first thought. Second thought is there is a kernel of truth in replacement theology, meaning not that God has replaced Israel with the church, but the church is supposed to be learning lessons from Israel, we do share a lot of those promises. We don't replace Israel. God has a plan and purpose for Israel and the Jews, but the entire nation of Israel, their history, was designed to show us how God interacts with mankind. And so of course there are lessons. Of course you can look at the nation of Israel and then say, well, how does that apply to the church? We do it yes. 
us. Every day when we teach scriptures, we say, this is what Moses went through and this is how we need to learn. And this is how, what David went through and this is how we did. So th that kernel of truth is true. It's just that this idea that God has done with the Jews, I think demonstrated that that's not the case, but there's really parallel tracks. And in some ways they're, they're interwoven tracks that God's plan and purpose for the Jewish people and plan and purpose for the church. But at some point, and I think at some point sooner rather than later, the church is removed. And then Israel, which has obviously been reborn, gaining ground in terms of its size and its importance in history, it's going to be the centerpiece, not the United States, not China, not Moscow, not London. Israel is going to be the centerpiece now, whether that answers the specific question as sort of a hermeneutics, I mean, I think the point is, to tie that all together, we need to look at every scripture that mentions Israel in two ways. One, what did it literally mean to the people of Israel then? What does it mean to Israel and the Jewish people today and in the future? Because that's one track. But also, what can we learn as individual followers of Christ, whether we're Jewish or Gentile? What can we learn from these things? Does that answer, does that answer yeah, your question? Yeah, it does. It does. And I think you helped answer it today when you said, well, if you have a promise in the Bible that the Jews are going to return to their land, and then you look and you say, they're there. That must be literal. It's pretty easy to connect those dots when you have a biblical hermeneutic formed via history unfolding itself in our days. You know, so many people say, boy, wouldn't it be great to live in Bible times? We are living in yeah, Bible right. times. And that's the great thing about studying Bible prophecy. You, you understand the relevance now to those dots being connected. Well, that's right. And that's why I'm sympathetic to those who lived in the 15th century who are like, you know, I mean, either they'd never met a Jew or they certainly didn't believe that God was going to bring Israel. There was, you know, they, and there was no evidence at that time. You'd have to literally go by faith. And that was hard for people. We have a question, um, not from anybody walking forward, but a text question. Obviously, people are feeling a little more comfortable with their handheld device. So I, I'm trying to guess that this is probably a younger person because they texted it. And I'm not going to tell you what age I think younger is, but here's the text question. What are your thoughts regarding the Muslims wanting to build a shrine near Ground Zero? Well, that's a good question. Um, I'm opposed to it. Because what the Islamic cleric, the imam, is, is saying that he wants is to pursue reconciliation and interfaith cultural dialogue. And I can't think of almost anything more provocative than building a mosque at ground zero. If you're hoping to build interfaith dialogue and you know, religious reconciliation, I really think you've picked the wrong approach. I think that's obvious. I don't think that's what he's really trying to do. I think he's building a victory mosque. We destroyed this, and now we're planting the flag of Islam. So, I, you know, I don't believe him, to be honest. Now, legally, I don't think there's anything that you can do unless they're literally engaged in some sort of terrorist activity and that that can be proven by the FBI. I think that if we legally try to oppose one faith building a house of worship, that's going to backlash pretty quickly. We're already having enough troubles in our own country. I don't think we want to have the precedent. So my hope there is that pray that it doesn't get built, but if the Lord allows it to be built, then we should saturate the zone with people who are sharing the gospel with everybody that comes in and out of the building. And uh, with love, I mean, truly, you know, show love and share the gospel and not be intimidated that somebody built a building and is lying about it. So, okay, that's not the first time in history. Uh, now, we have another text message, but before we do, let's take uh, a, a live question, please. Okay. Um, Joel, a good friend of mine is well, born and raised in Israel and is Jewish. And her response to Jesus Christ is, you know, the Messiah was to be born of the um, lineage of David. And since he has immaculate conception, how can they prove his lineage since the tribe comes from the man, from the father? So what would your response be? In that kind of situation. That's a great question. Um, that's a fun question. Uh, that's why there are genealogies in Matthew and Luke, uh, because it traces the lineage of Jesus' uh, mother and father. It's interesting. I was with a uh, ministry uh, just uh, the other day, and they were telling me something very interesting that, uh, you know, most of us, we skip over the genealogies, to be honest, right? We're like, okay, he began him, he began him. Okay, let's get to the Jesus part, right? But 
this ministry leader that we met uh, with and we were doing some work with and mentioned when he travels to uh, African countries and other countries around the world, genealogy is like a huge thing. Like you're important in the tribe, in the village, because your father was so-and-so and his father was so-and-so and, and they can go back centuries. Mm -hmm. It's a big deal. And so therefore, if a leader is coming, and it's an important leader, the tribal chief or whatever will begin to explain the genealogy of who's coming. And by the time they get there, they're like, oh, this guy's a big deal. And this ministry provides the Bible on audio. It's actually a local ministry, uh, Faith Comes By Hearing. And we, and we just love these guys. And we, he was saying, you know, when the audio on Matthew chapter one, verse one, you know, for me, again, <laughs> my instinct is to skip that part. Let's just get to the birth of Jesus. But when people in various tribes around the world hear the lineage of Jesus, they're like, oh my gosh, that's like a huge deal. Now for Jews, it's very important also because that lineage, you have to get back to King David and both Jesus' mother's side, Mary's side, and the father's side. Either way you want to go, it both leads back to David. And uh, so the, it's, it's hugely significant. You know, Rabbi Menachem Schneerson, the rabbi from Brooklyn, the Rebbe, they called him, People thought he was the Messiah, but he's from Brooklyn. And as far as I read uh, Micah chapter 5, verse 2, the Messiah will be coming from Bethlehem Ephrata, not from Brooklyn. Now, God bless the people of Brooklyn. You know, they're my peeps, but I'm just saying, <laughs> you really have to come from Bethlehem Ephrata, and you have to be born of the lineage of David. And that's, and fortunately, the New Testament gave us that information in great detail even though most of us don't really focus on it, some people do and some people need to. So, thank you. Let's take another one. Uh, hi, Joel, I'm Dan Guterres. And uh, my question essentially um, involves God blessing those countries that bless Israel and those uh, countries, of course, being cursed uh, by God that curse Israel. Now, you know, if we have, say, in the United States, an administration that is uh, less than pro-Israel, uh, yet we have a, uh, a populist or a church who, of course, is pro-Israel. Who do you think God would then judge? Does he judge the nation because of its leaders, or does he judge the nation based on its people? That is a great question, and I think it goes to an important element, which is that God is patient. Yes, there, he will eventually make a sovereign decision about judging, but he's not looking to curse nations. Let's, we should be very clear about this. So let me put this in this context. Uh, you know, the Lord sifts that out and makes a determination, but he doesn't, it's not knee-jerk. It's not like, oh, this government suddenly did something bad. If that were the case, there would be no Iran. There would be no Saudi Arabia. And that's not the case. God is patient. He doesn't want anyone to perish, but all to come to you know, knowledge of, of Jesus Christ as the Savior. And so the Lord forestalls those final judgments uh, for a long time. Now, I've had people come to me and say, well, don't, you know, some people have written books on this and, and web logging, and they, they say, well, you see, when, you know, this particular American president did something bad, then we had this hurricane. And then this person did something bad, and they had this earthquake. And, and I say, you know, you know, look, those things could correlate. I mean, I mean that's possible. But number one, you know, he's not really telling us that that's what he's doing. Secondly, you'd have to be able to go to Iran, for example. Can you do this? Can you, every time that Mahmoud Ahmadinejad curses Israel, do they have an earthquake or a hurricane? It's not a game. We can't jump to, you know, and that bad thing happened in that country in a, you know, sometime in a real time scenario. Look at Egypt. If you curse the Jews, you're going to be cursed. They got 430 years, right? I mean, they were cursing Jews every day, every week for 430 years. You'd think, Lord, come on, kick in Genesis 12 already. But God loves the Egyptian people. He didn't want to bring judgment. He was very patient, more patient than we would be, but fortunately, he's more patient with us <laughs> as well. So does, is that helpful in terms of trying to sift that through? Yeah, I appreciate it very much. Great. Now, before we get another one live from the floor, we have um, one that was emailed in about Ezekiel 38 and 39. And let me read it. Ezekiel 38 and 39 speak of a major battle, the battle of Gog and Magog. This will clearly be a battle witnessed worldwide. How can we, as the church, prepare for this great evangelistic opportunity? What should we be doing now to prepare to give an answer for what will happen? Great question. Um, 
wow, there's so many pieces of that. Look, the first thing is, you know, War of Gog and Magog, uh, that's Russia, Iran, Turkey, Libya, these other countries that will surround Israel and seek to attack, destroy, take over Israel in what Ezekiel said would be the last days. We know this time reference is an end times prophecy. What's amazing, and you and I have talked about it with the Epicenter film and the Epicenter conferences and you know so on and so forth, is it's pretty intriguing where we are now geopolitically. Like Russia is building an alliance with Iran. Turkey has just turned from the West towards Iran and Russia and Syria. You know, Libya is there. I mean, there's an awful lot of evidence that suggests we're tracking towards the War of Gog and Magog. Now, I don't think that the data is conclusive yet, but it's certainly curious, right? So we don't know for certain it's going to happen in our lifetime, but based on what's happening, you can't rule it out. All that to say, it means to me, this goes back to your earlier question of like, all right, the prophecy seems to motivate you, Joel, not just to be interested in it and teach it, but to do something about it. Yes, for Lynn, my wife, and my boys and myself, you know, for us, we said, okay, listen, what if we did live in the time that Ezekiel 38 and 39 was going to happen? We don't know it for sure, but we don't know it isn't. So rather than just write books and speeches and even holding conferences, I think we need to do something more practical. So we began this ministry called the Joshua Fund in uh, the summer of 2006 to mobilize Christians to bless Israel and her neighbors in the name of Jesus, according to Genesis 12, verses 1 through 3. And so what did that mean for us? Well, we had to define, well, what does it mean to bless Israel? And, you know, it certainly meant to uh, mobilize Christians to understand God's heart for Israel, that he hadn't rejected Israel, to counter replacement theology. To us, that's the Joshua Fund mission, to help Christians get those four words into our hearts and our heads. Learn, pray, give, and go, because that will get us ready both for the geopolitical war that might be next or the prophetic war that might be next. Learn what God's doing in the region and God's heart for the people of the region. Pray knowledgeably, faithfully, consistently for the leaders of Israel, for the people of Israel, for the church in Israel, uh, for the church in the Muslim world, for the enemies of Israel, for the neighbors of Israel. I mean, there's all kinds of ways to be praying, and we try to encourage people in specific ways. Learn, pray, give. Give to ministries that are doing effective work to be a blessing in Israel. Uh, the Joshua Fund, we provide food, clothing, medical supplies, other relief aid. We recently bought some ambulances for Israel's uh, you know, emergency relief uh, system. Uh, we're caring for Holocaust survivors, widows, orphans, all, Jews and Arabs. And so, you know, to the extent that people want to give to what we're doing, that would be great because we think there's a lot of preparations that Joshua Fund and other needs to be doing. We're currently renting a warehouse in central Israel. It's about 10,000 square feet. And we're buying these food and other supplies in bulk. Keeps the price down a little. Then we were able to distribute it to seven food distribution centers around the country. This requires a lot of money to do these things, to buy trucks, to transfer all these things, hire staff to do these things. We're doing it, why? For two reasons. One, to care for the poor and needy now, and mostly we deliver these relief supplies through local believers so they can be a witness and they can be a blessing. But we're also trying to prepare for whatever's coming. And since we don't know if Ezekiel 38 and 39 will happen in our lifetime, I go back to Ezekiel 38, verse 7, where the Lord says to Gog, the Russian dictator, get ready, be prepared. And I'm thinking... If God is saying to the enemy of Israel, get ready and be prepared, shouldn't the church be doing the same thing? And that's what the Joshua Fund is. So learn, pray, give, and then go. Go and see what God is doing over there. Go and meet pastors and, and ministry leaders. Go and visit uh, Israelis and, and Arabs who don't have any faith in Jesus, but for whom we're supposed to serve and be humble servants uh, to them. And of course, that's what the conference and tour next year will be about. So that's the way we've tried to uh, help people get, get their hands around it. How do you prepare, learn, pray, give, and go? And I think that gives sort of a construct by which a person can walk away and say, Lord, okay, maybe Joshua Fund, maybe Samaritan Purse, maybe whatever else, but Lord, show me what you want me specifically to do so that when you're standing before the Lord, as, I, as Lynn and I say, all right, when we're standing before the Lord and he says, you wrote the Ezekiel option, you wrote Epicenter, you made that film Epicenter, 
with Skip. You held a conference. You knew these things were coming at some point. Why is that all you did? Why didn't you, you know, build a ministry that could care for and strengthen and prepare for all that was coming? And so that's what we're trying to do. That's our answer that we believe is from the Lord to respond to this preparation. But I'm trying to get Christians all over the world to say, all right, and what are you supposed to do? And maybe that's coming to help us, but maybe the Lord has another plan for you. Uh, before the question, just an FYI, if you can see on the screen, maybe we could put this up. Joining us online is Shokat Brunner, originally from Iran. I recognize this lady because she joins our broadcast quite often. Originally from Iran, now living in Fredericksburg, Virginia. Most of her family still lives in Iran. She was a Shiite Muslim. Now she's a Christian, a believer. Hello, Shokat. God bless you. Amen. Welcome. Amen. Please. Hi, my name is Letitia Keith, and um, I'm glad to have you here. Thank you. I'm um, studying the book of Isaiah, and we're in chapter 13 and 14, and that's where God's judging the neighboring countries or the nations. So I just felt a real blessing for you to be here, because I just feel like it's all coming together. But um, I have a family in Colorado, and they believe they're from the true church, and that I'm not. I was sharing with them about the replacement theology, and how um, there's the archbishops that are saying that, you know, the Jewish people can't take the position of using the Bible. And um, she's, my sister told me that that's not what the Catholic leaders believe and that they support the Jewish people. And so my question to you is, okay, if the Pope is the head of the Catholic Church, and then there's the archbishops or the Vatican and the archbishops. How does that happen? Is it, is it coming from the Pope to the archbishop saying what you had shared with us? Or are there like sects that believe something that's not coming from the Pope? Or That's an excellent question, and it's important. And I, and I try to be nuanced in what I was saying, meaning these particular archbishops and bishops gathered together in, a, in an official conference at the Vatican and this is where they came out. Now, the document that was released was not great, not terrible, but as I quoted from the New York Times, the statements that got made in the final communique and even in the press conference, beyond what was written and agreed upon by these bishops and archbishops, seemed to go even further than the communique itself or the document. And as I noted, not all Catholics believe in replacement theology. And what was particularly troubling about this episode last month was that, you know, the church leaders, the popes uh, in the last few decades, I would say there's been a, an attempt to build relations with Jews, to change course a little bit. It's been incremental, but for example, the pope visited Israel in 2000. That was a big deal. It was a big deal for Israel, who has seen historically the Roman Catholic Church be replacement theology and isn't entirely convinced that they're not now, but they were very glad to welcome the Pope and a number of the cardinals and others that came on that delegation. So I was disappointed to then suddenly with some, you know, steady but incremental progress that has been made. It's not been great, but it hasn't been bad. It's been progress. That's what progress is, right? This didn't go well. I haven't seen any quote by the current Pope that says that he endorses these conclusions but it's not like it was held off in a corner someplace. I mean, you know, it's at the Vatican. By the way, I, I, had, I was invited to the Vatican last year for the premiere of that Damascus film that I referred to. I know not all of you were with us for the, the last session, but I hope you can listen to the last story I told uh, in the story on um, God's heart for the neighbors. A, a film, an evangelistic film called Damascus was made by Arab Syrian believers for Syrians. And I got invited, they were gonna show it at the Vatican. I was like, really, wow. But I had another engagement and I had made a commitment to this pastor and I, I just didn't think I could break it. But Lynn and I were invited to go there and we thought, wow, that would have been exciting. I have met wonderful born again Catholics and some who literally work at the Vatican. And I know they love Israel and I know they love the Jewish people and I know they love Jesus very, very much. Sort of in the opposite order, but I'm just saying, so I don't want to throw out this idea that it's all Catholic and it's all Protestants. It never has been, and there's a remnant everywhere. 
and we need to strengthen what remains, uh, you know, the Lord said to the church at, at, at Sardis, so in, in Revelation. So that's, well, let's go build those relationships and not concede that even those who are teaching in the wrong direction shouldn't be engaged lovingly. Not to debate these people, but to say, hey, you know, maybe that seemed true for 1900 years, but let's relook at that scripturally. Is that, is that helpful to, okay. Thank you Thank very you much. That. Um, before we take another one from the floor, we have a text question, Joel. What is the history of the Dome of the Rock? Now, the Dome of the Rock, of course, for reference, is the Golden Dome sitting on the temple area where the temple once stood. What's the history of it? Well, it goes back, um, I don't know, maybe 12 centuries or something, 11 centuries. I don't, I don't recall exactly when it was built. It wasn't always golden. One of the pieces of the story of the Dome of the Rock is that King Hussein who lost control of the West Bank, uh, Judea and Samaria, and Jerusalem. But before that happened, he wanted to do something that would strengthen his relationship with the Palestinians. And so he decided to gold plate that dome. So it was, it was always sort of a, a black slate uh, historically, but you know, maybe it was 40 years ago or so, 50 years, 45 years ago, they added gold plating on that dome. It's pretty spectacular. The problem is the dome was built as an Islamic victory mosque. It's not literally a mosque. There's the Al-Aqsa Mosque called the Mosque in the Corner on that same Temple Mount platform. But the dome is built literally right over where the Holy of Holies was. And it's interesting because uh, you can't go in there now if you're not a Muslim. But when I was in college, in, in back in the 80s, in 1987, I got a chance to go in. Now, if they'd known I was a Jewish believer in Jesus, who eventually would work for Netanyahu, I'm sure they never would have let me in, but they didn't know that. So <clears throat> I went in and was, I was with a guide who helped read for me the Arabic inscriptions in there. And one of the striking things about the dome is that inside there's a Arabic saying that says, I'm paraphrasing, but God is one, he, does not beget, and he was not begotten. This is not a direct assault on Jewish control of the Temple Mount once. This is a direct assault on John chapter 3, verse 16. Muslims never imagined, historically, that Jews would ever be a threat to them. Never imagined Israel would be reborn as a country. I mean, talk about replacement theology. <laughs> They'd done the replacing, and they were like, yeah, that's never gonna happen. What they were concerned about was Christians, and they wanted to make a statement in Arabic, at the center of God's plan and purpose for humanity, John 3.16 is not true. God does not have an only begotten son. He does not beget, and he was not begotten. Well, that's true, God was not begotten, but he did beget, not the way we think of it, but that's taking direct aim that Jesus is not the son of God. And look, it's not gonna, that's not gonna last. That's not gonna hold up. And I don't know exactly how that was removed. I'm opposed to all violent ways to have it removed, but God is going to have his day, and uh, I think it's coming. Let me just add a little uh, piggyback on that for a thumbnail, quick thumbnail sketch. When Islam developed around 638 AD, they quickly moved to the land of Judea and took over Jerusalem, and they built the Dome of the Rock. The Quran never mentions Jerusalem, but it's odd through their tradition that it has become the third holiest site to Islam. They made quick haste of expelling all of the Jews out of Jerusalem when they built that mosque, and they were setting up, planting their flag there. Now, years later, when the Crusaders came in, they took over Jerusalem, 1095 when they started, but by the time they got to Jerusalem and they expelled the Muslims from Jerusalem, they put a cross atop the Dome of the Rock. And when the... Muslims took back Jerusalem. You know, it's gone through a lot of wars. They took the cross off, and Saladin, the one who was in charge of that occupation at that time, took the cross um, and drug it through Jerusalem to defame Christ followers and built it back into a mosque. So that animosity over that piece of real estate has been ongoing for quite some time. Go ahead, please. Hi, I'm Jeannie Seiler. Thank you for coming. We've learned a lot. Um, you had mentioned today in Genesis 17, around verse 20, we were talking about 
the children that um, Abraham would be having by Sarah and the maidservant. But he is also questioning God about Ishmael. Will you give him any blessings? And so I was thinking about this all day today where God did say he will be the father of 12 rulers. And that's really bugged me all day. Who are these 12 rulers that Ishmael would be over? Or it would come from him? That's a good question. <laughs> I don't know. Because, uh, I think candor would probably be better than me fishing. Um, because what, what you were reading was, it says, and I will surely bless him. I will make him fruitful and will greatly increase his number. He will be the father of 12 rulers, and I will make him into a great nation. So the 12 rulers is what was bothering me. Yeah, that's a good question. And uh, Skip, maybe you know specifically. I I'm gonna go research that, because I'd like to have an answer to that. Generally, on the multiplication, um, nobody's multiplying faster th than the Muslims in the Middle East. I mean, God bless their hearts. Uh, they're having eight, 10, 12, 14 kids. Uh, Jews are having like 1.4 or something. You know, it's, I mean, among Orthodox, it's higher, but people talk about Muslims taking over Europe because they're having eight, nine, 10, 12 kids, and, and Europeans are like, yeah, whatever. We don't even believe in the family. So uh, it's a problem, right? And so the whole fruitful and multiplying thing is, is something that they're taking very seriously, and, and it's, of course, it's prophetic. But I'm going to go look that up, and I appreciate I don't get out. I mean, I, I like getting asked questions, and I'm like, hmm, I need to go do more research. And Skip will tell us. <laughs> Tell Skip at some point because okay, he knows us knows. and you, he'll tell are, us. Are you, do you know that's what, what 12? I'm trying to jog my memory because <laughs> I have read up on this. A lot of it is obscured by history. It's not, you know, the Bible record drops genealogies and tips its hat only superficially to the genealogy that is there because it wants to quickly get to the genealogies that matter. It presents certain genealogical lines. We know where Ishmael settled, and we, we know that they set, uh, settled around the area of Israel uh, in Saudi Arabia, in the mountains of Edom, et cetera, et cetera. And there has been a pretty good stab at who those leaders might have been, but because it's obscured in history, it is typically seen as a guess. And that's the best that I can do. We have one here that's been texted in. I've heard, this is a common question, Joel. You get this at every prophecy conference, and every time we teach on eschatology, this is one of the top ten. I've heard that the U.S. is nowhere to be found in the end times prophecy in the Bible. Is that true? What do you think our role as America will be either way? It is the number one question I get asked all over the country, with the exception of how can you be Jewish and believe in Jesus, which, of course, is my perennial favorite. But other than that, that's the number one. And it's absolutely true. There's no place that I feel is a credible case that the United States is mentioned to, uh, mentioned uh, in end times prophecy or in the Bible at all. I think the closest allusion, in my view, would be Matthew 24, 14, where Jesus is saying in the end times, all these terrible things are going to be going on. But in Matthew 24, 14, he says this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in the whole world as a testimony to all nations, and then the end shall come. Now, I think the United States has sat squarely in the middle of that verse. Not We don't own that verse, but we're in that verse. Why? Because this is where so much of the missions work, training, recruiting, developing, and sending has, has happened historically in the last several hundred years. Uh, this is the ATM machine for the world's uh, missions movement. Uh, this is, you know, satellite television technology that's reaching these closed countries with the gospel, developed here. Radio technology that reaching people with the gospel, developed here. Thank God for Al Gore inventing the internet, right? Because... Uh, <laughs> You spent time in politics. I'm just well, picking I, up. There's so much of it this weekend. Yeah, well, I'm not. Look, I, you know, no, I mean, he claimed it. So I'm just saying all these things, satellite, radio, internet, that can be used for evil. I mean, pornography and all kinds of other horror shows, but God has used it also to drive the gospel. And so I think the United States fits in Matthew 24, 14. But there's a lot of countries that are mentioned specifically, and there's a lot of regions and sections and people groups that are mentioned specifically in end times prophecy, and we're not there. I mean, even like people say, well, what about China and what about you know North Korea and Indonesia and these kind? 
Well, no, those are not mentioned, but at least you have in you know, Revelation 16, uh, the Lord refers to the kings of the east will marshal their militaries, come up the Euphrates through Iraq to come to Armageddon. So, okay, we don't know exactly which the kings of the east are, but you know, it wouldn't be unreasonable to imagine that they may be China, North Korea, what have you. But there's no kings of the west mentioned. So the bottom line is the question, all right, if we're not mentioned as a player in the last days, and we're already in the last days, what happens to us? And the answer is, I don't know. I don't know because the scripture doesn't say, but there's a few options. One option is the rapture. You know, in a blink of an eye, 20, 30, 40, 50, 60 million, maybe more followers of Christ disappear. Now you think we've, America's got a foreclosure problem now, you know, who's, who's paying their mortgages the day after that baby happens? Uh, and that's, you know, just, you know, a sort of a funny way of thinking that the country implodes after the rapture. Now, I think China it would, would lose at least 100 million people from the rapture, maybe more. Would Europe notice? You know, would there be any work costs? I mean, tragically, I mean, I'm going there this week. We'll see what, you know, I don't think Europe is going to be affected deeply by the rapture. But the rapture would have an effect on the United States, obviously. But there's other possibilities, natural disasters. I mean, what if one Katrina after another just came, you know, and the Lord allowed one after another, uh, or earthquakes and, you know, California breaks off, or there's all kinds of reasons why the United States would suddenly be so internally focused that even while end times events were happening, we wouldn't be players. You could have a financial collapse. I don't think that's an unreasonable concept when you've got $120 trillion of debt, at least unfunded liabilities that we've said we're going to pay somebody someday and those bills are coming due soon. So bad political leadership, nuclear war, terrorism, there's a lot of scenarios. None of them are good except for the rapture for us, but I'm very concerned for our country. And let me just put it this way to tie that off. Given the corruption, pornography, abortion, all the things that are going on in our country today, you know, Billy Graham, your friend, has said famously, if God doesn't bring judgment eventually on the United States, short of a, of a revival, he will owe an apology to Sodom and Gomorrah. Now, I pray for that revival. I don't want to see us go through that judgment. But if we were on top of all that to add betrayal of Israel, you know, I shudder to think where we're heading. So, Please. Uh, hi, my name is Larry. Um, my question is, uh, I've heard that uh, the underground Christian church in Iran is, uh, believers is around 4 million believers. Is that number correct? We don't know exactly the numbers because obviously you can't do uh, a census. Um, you know, it's a very hostile government, of course. Uh, I mean, these guys believe in the 12th Imam. They believe they're going to destroy Jews and Christians. Um, they're not allowing anybody to go in and do any scientific research. Uh, and when I did a research for my nonfiction book last year, Inside the Revolution, I interviewed about 40 Iranian Christian leaders. I didn't go to Iran, but um, I interviewed people here that live in the United States that are Iranian Christian leaders and those that are in the region that could come out or live on the borders. And the bottom line was they all said that the number of Shia Muslim converts to Christianity has increased from about 500 in 1979 to over a million today. Now, some have said to me 4 million, some have said to me 7 million. I don't think they really know. And so, you know, the way I describe it in Inside the Revolution is this is what all 40 independently told me. This is their sense on the ground and from all their different sources of, of data. I don't think we really know. The point is the trajectory that God is doing this unbelievably amazing move where he's pouring out his Holy Spirit in ways that make me jealous. I mean, that's, you're going to talk about provoking me to, and juice to jealousy. Uh, you know, there's maybe 15,000 believers in Jesus in Israel. There's over a million in Iran. I mean, Lord, hello, you know. Now, we'll have our day, you know, and we have to be faithful in prayer and all the rest. But it's exciting. And let me just give you one quick example. So, my wife and I were traveling in Europe a few years ago, about 10 years ago, actually, and we happened to get invited to come to a ministry center that was hidden in a house in a suburb. And they have, in the basement of this house, it's a whole, like, communication center. And so what they do is they show the Jesus film 
in Farsi, the Iranian language, on satellite television. And then they've got an 800 number. It's not 800, but I mean, it's a, it's a number that you can call and it gets bounced all over the world and it happens to come to this house. <laughs> and Iranian believers in Jesus who had to flee for their lives out of Iran, they staffed the call center and people call in and say, I want to learn more and I want to get a Bible and what do I do and I don't understand this. So we got to invite to come see this thing. So long story short, they're, they're telling us this story about how this woman, this elderly woman, was watching television one night on satellite television and was bored with everything, you know, how it is, click, you got all these channels and there's nothing, right? Click, 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 click. And she comes to a moment of the Jesus film and she's like, what was that? I never, you know, because Muslims know that Jesus was important. The Quran says he was born of a virgin, that he did miracles, that they're supposed to read the Injil, the New Testament, though all the governments tell them they can't. He was born of a virgin of Mary. So, but they don't know anything else about him. They know they're supposed to revere him, but they're kind of curious about him. So she's watching this film about Jesus and she's just mesmerized. And at the end of the film, the narrator says, um, you know, she explains how to receive Christ. And the verse that flashed up on the screen was Revelation 3, verse 20. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in and sup with him and he with me. So the woman had never heard this verse. She didn't know exactly what it meant. So she thought, I'm supposed to open the door. So she gets up and she hobbles over to the door and she opens the door. <laughs> Boom, she's hit in the face with a bolt of light. And she's like, who is it? And Jesus says, it is I. And she says, come in, my Lord. And Jesus walks into her room and begins to talk to her for a little while about his, his love for her and the people of Iran, and he wants her to follow him. And suddenly he disappears. So she's like, oh my gosh. So she looks back at the screen and there's this, you know, 800 number, this number to call. So she calls the call center and it goes, you know, all over the world and it winds up in the basement of this house. The Iranian Christian you know, operator says, can I help you? And she says, I just saw Jesus. And this operator says, yeah, isn't that an amazing film? Isn't that a great film, the Jesus film? She's like, no, no, you don't understand. I just saw Jesus. They get the calls like this all the time. And that's just one slice of one ministry at one period of time. And that was 10 years ago. God is moving. He loves the people of Iran. It's, I have just so loved getting to know the people of Iran. My wife is discipling a Shia Muslim convert, a woman uh, who came to faith. In fact, real quickly, oh, these are so great stories. I, I don't want to take up the night with all the stories, but just, just one. There's these two doctors in the Washington, D.C. area. The guy is a South Korean, and he was a Presbyterian. But he was not really walking with the Lord, and he was training a young doctor, and she happened to be an Iranian Shia Muslim. And he fell in love, and they decided to get married. But the only way they could get married is if he converted to Shia Islam. So he did. His Presbyterian parents freak out. What are you doing? But, well, they get married, and they're going along, and she has a vision of Jesus. So she becomes a follower of Jesus. He's like, wait a minute. <laughs> uh, I need a judge's ruling on this. Um... I converted from Christianity to Islam, and now you're converting from Islam to Christianity. What? But she's just on fire, and my wife has been discipling her, and she's making disciples. And he, a number of years ago, said, well, I, he realized, you know, the mistake he'd made. But God was gracious. He came back. I've been discipling him. And now he's just itching to find young men who are, you know, willing to be trained to make disciples themselves. These are just a few of just countless examples of how powerfully God is moving in Iran. I don't know the numbers. We'll know when we get to heaven, but the dynamic is what's important. And we've never seen more Muslims come to Christ than we have in these last 30 years. Thank you so much. Uh, Joel, we have a question that's been emailed to us. The question is, when did the United States become the great Satan? And to frame that, you've often said that uh, the leadership within Iran who believe in the 12th Imam have framed the United States as the great Satan and Israel as the small Satan. When did that happen? When did we become the great Satan? It's a good question. And, and you know, when you go back through the literature, when I first start seeing it mentioned is uh, really in the 1970s, you know, I mean, the guy who made it most famous, I would say, would be the Ayatollah Khomeini. I'm sure that he was not the first. I suspect he wasn't the first, but, but he certainly popularized that idea that, that the United States is the great Satan. 
you know, obviously, if you, it's not in the Quran because we didn't exist, um, and Israel didn't exist either uh, back in the seventh century. So, it, it really was when Israel was reborn, and the United States became, you know, the best friend of Israel, and Israel became the best friend of us, and this began to creep into the the theology that well, because Israel is the epicenter of Judaism, well, that's you know, wrong in their view. And since they see the United States as the epicenter of Christendom, then we're even worse than the Jews. So that's where that term came from. But again, I first started seeing it in the 70s, um, though I suspect it probably dates back a little bit earlier. Thank in fact, you. Khomeini himself, I think, was probably saying it in the 60s, but it just wasn't popularized outside the region. Right. Thanks, uh, Joel. My name is Dan. Uh, are the Jews preparing for another temple, and is another temple necessary to fulfill biblical prophecy? Yes, and yes. Next question. No, uh, <laughs> no, I appreciate Dan. No, uh, uh, that's a great question. And uh, in my book, Epicenter, I've got a whole chapter on preparations that are being made. Yes, uh, Orthodox Jews, ultra Orthodox Jewish groups are really preparing. In fact, I think we did a little bit in the Epicenter film on this, but uh, these groups are making clothing for the priests. They're building the implements that will be used to do temple sacrifices. A lot of it, I think, is done at this point. Uh, one thing that's interesting is that, you know, the Sanhedrin was the council that in the scriptures were 71 rabbis that ran all the functions, all the operations of the temple. Well, after the temple was destroyed in 70 AD, the Sanhedrin held on thinking, well, okay, the Bible does indicate that there'll be a new temple again. That is part of Bible prophecy, and it's critical to end times theology. So they thought, let's hold on. And so it went to the, I think the fifth century, the 400s, and they finally were like, all right, whatever. And they disbanded. But in 2006, the Sanhedrin reconvened. First time in, you know, almost basically, you know, what were the, what were the 1500 years or so. And uh, they've got 71 rabbis and they've, uh, they ordered architectural plans to be made for the temple. And I uh, have on my web blog, I track these things as they come up in the news. If you were to Google, you know, Joel Rosenberg and temple and poll and Israelis, something like that, you'd get a poll that came out, I think in the last year or so, that showed, I think it was like 63% or so of Israelis want the temple to be built. Which is kind of amazing because most Israelis are secular. I mean, literally like 80 plus percent either don't believe in God or don't care. So Orthodox and ultra-Orthodox, these are very small minorities. You can't get a majority for that. But I believe this is a rising instinct inside Jewish life. And it's not because the rabbis are so popular there. Most Israeli Jews are like, I'm done with religion. I'm so done. Let's get on a plane and go to India and find a guru. Let's go to some other place and snort something else. I mean, let's have any supernatural or metaphysical experience that I could possibly find short of actually going to synagogue or, you know, talking to a rabbi. And that's just the mindset that they don't really know God. They're a bunch of hypocrites. That's the feeling. So the fact that 60 plus percent of Israelis today want the temple to be built. Wow. I think we're not that far. And one other thing. In Revelation 11, well, it's Revelation 11, one second. Uh, this is an interesting point that I think it's overlooked because a lot of Bible prophecy teachers say that uh, when the Antichrist basically signs or confirms a peace treaty with Israel, then at the beginning of the tribulation, the temple will be rebuilt. I don't buy that personally, though I understand where that comes from. But in Revelation 11, John, the Apostle John, is told to measure a fully operational temple. Okay? At the same moment, that's, so that's verse 1 and 2. Verse 3 is God saying he's going to grant his two witnesses the authority to preach the gospel in front of that operational temple, and it actually says for 1,260 days, meaning from the first day of the tribulation, these two witnesses, some people say Elijah and Moses, others say Elijah and Enoch, because they had never died, and man is appointed once to die in the face of judgment. We don't know who they're going to be, but they're going to be out there preaching the gospel and having supernatural signs and wonders in front of a fully operational temple. And we know the date is going to be the first day of the tribulation, because halfway in the tribulation, 
God allows these two t uh, witnesses to be assassinated and then their bodies lie there for three and a half days. People that have basically Christmas, all over the world, people are giving each other presents because they're like, great, these two guys are gone. Woohoo! And then they're resurrected. Wow. You don't want to be there for that, people. If you haven't given your life to Christ, please, tonight's the night. You can see that on the big screen, I'm sure, from heaven. But anyway, but we know the timing. So how can you build a temple starting on the first day of the tribulation if it's supposed to be fully operational the first day? So my sense is, and my dad was an architect for 35 plus years, now in full-time ministry, but he, just from looking at his life as an architect, I think, wow, I suspect the process of building that temple is gonna start prior to the tribulation and possibly, possibly prior to the rapture. We could start seeing the uh, temple being built in our lifetime, possibly. I mean, so yeah, it's inbound. Thank you for the question. Hi, this is Joel Rosenberg. After this episode, I'd encourage you to go to joshuafund.com and sign up for our e-newsletter. I'm continually moved by the stories of impact and God's mercies on the people of Israel and her neighbors. And these impact reports are delivered straight to my inbox. They can be delivered straight to yours. Stories of powerful life transformation across the epicenter. joshuafund.com. You won't regret it. Joel, I was shown a schematic years ago of the diagram of the electrical for the temple. And oh, really? the dispute, rabbinical dispute going on was, can we modernize it that much to even use electricity in the uh, newly furbished temple? Before we get to this question, we have one that came in via email. It says, I heard that Israel is sitting on vast oil reserves. Are you aware of any support to this statement? And if so, why hasn't it been exploited? I would think this would ignite world interest as world reserves dwindle. Well, that's a great question. And, you know, when I first wrote my first novel, The Last Jihad, I had a massive fictional discovery of oil and gas. Then the last days, the second novel picks up on that idea as part of the, you know, John Bennett's my Wall Street strategist turned White House operative, blah, blah, blah. And he's been all over this building up, you know, of seizing this, this oil and gas discovery. It was all fictional. It was based on some possibility that something had been found, but I thought, let's build on that. Now, when I was doing a book signing in Bakersfield, California, for the last days, some guy comes up to me and says, that's not fiction. That's true. I said, what's true? He said, they have found oil in Israel. And in fact, there are Bible prophecies that say that they'll find oil, petroleum in the last days in Israel. I'm like, now, honestly, I mean, I'd love to tell you, oh, yes, 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 I knew how to, I all knew that was going to happen. I honestly didn't. I just didn't, I, no one had ever taught me that. So I went and studied it, and I'm like, oh my gosh, there are Bible prophecies that say that the oil is going to be found in Israel in the last days. So there's a chapter on that in Epicenter, the nonfiction book. But since then, since 2006, when Epicenter came out, wow, wow. Oil keeps being discovered in different parts of Israel, but look, I'm not a geologist, so I'm a failed political consultant, so just keep this all in context. But apparently the density, the porosity, the something, they can't seem to get the oil out of the ground in commercial quantities without it costing so much because it's just extremely difficult to extract. But Israel has now discovered about 120 trillion trillion cubic feet of natural gas. And most of this is off the coast of Israel, some towards Gaza, most of it towards Haifa. And this is a game changer. And Israel, the Israeli press is all over this thing. They just began drilling, I think it was last month or the month before, for the rigs that will be offshore rigs to get this natural gas to market. Two pieces of information that are important to note. Number one, this feels real to me. The oil discoveries, I think, are real, but they're not commercialized. The experts in the world industry, in particular in Israel, say that Israel is likely to be energy independent in the next two to three years, and then a net exporter of natural gas, likely to Europe, in the next two, three, four years. This is huge. And you can know it's true in part because the Israeli tax authority is all over this and saying that the the law that had been on the books, like if you ever found natural gas or oil, you know, we tax it at like, you know, whatever, 12%. But now they're like, oh, no, 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 no. This is all ours. We need a lot more than 12%. And the companies are saying, hey, hey, you already had a law. You can't go back and take, they're like, yes, we can. It's our gas and you can't have it unless we say so. 
when the Israeli tax authority gets into the battle, you can suspect that we're inbound for something very real. And I think this will be a game changer. If the Lord allows this thing to come fully online, wow, imagine that Russia, which is the, probably the world's most aggressive exporter of natural gas, particularly to Europe, they are not going to be happy. They're not big on competition, you know, there. Uh, <laughs> the communist mindset. And the Arab Islamic world, not going to be happy either, likely. So just when Israel finds itself blessed, you know, it's going to trigger more attacks and threats. Thanks, Joel. Please, Kylie. My name is Carrie. I just wanted to dovetail a little bit in your comment on revelations. It just so happened you touched on it a little in the previous question. In past Bible studies I've done and in my own quiet times in tackling revelations, which I find to be exciting and it's um, challenging, but it's encouraging in the same respect um, as it dovetails with the Old Testament and prophecy. Do you find with your experience that you find a correlation with those who avoid tackling revelations and embracing replacement theology? Because in my opinion, once you read Revelation, you can't but be excited for what's happening and what's in store for Israel and the world and how God's going to use Israel. Do you find that correlation? Have you found that in your experience where there's an avoidance of tackling Revelation and an embracing of replacement theology? In part, yes. In part, yeah, people can still study it and just totally blow the interpretation of it. For example, uh, so we've been talking about replacement theology. Yeah, so, so the first answer to drill in a little bit more, yes. If you're not going to study end times prophecy at all, you're not likely to get it. I think that's fairly true about anything. If you don't study it carefully, okay, you know, it's like me in geology. Okay, I, don't, I can't speak to it. I've never studied it. So that is a problem. But there's another problem, which is then there's people who do study the book of Revelation, and this gets into what's called preterism, or partial preterism, where they say, oh yeah, yeah, that's all true, and it's all happened. And you're like, I'm sorry? Oh yeah, 70 AD, all of this stuff happened. All of it? All of it. Okay, um, I mean, there's a lot of things that happened in 70 AD and thereabouts that are similar, but are we living in the Millennial Kingdom? Because I'm be not letting my children hang out near holes with cobras, and you can take your lion and your lamb, but don't take mine. I mean, you know, and they'll say, oh, well, you know, so that's where you get partial predators, and where they'll back, like, all right, all right, it mostly happened, but, and then you try to ask, well, what is the partial part? I mean, why do you believe it, it all basically happened, but you're conceding that it's not quite a perfect world? Uh, yeah. So this is a big, um, it's not new, but it's, it's sort of developing. And, and then there's amillennialism. That's a whole theology that says, in Revelation, when it says there's going to be a thousand-year reign of Jesus, they're like, yeah, that's not going to happen. Really? Okay. So that's people who are reading. So let's just, you know, here we go. In uh, Revelation chapter 20, it talks about how, um, verse 5, the rest of the dead did not come to life until the thousand years were completed. This is the first resurrection. It's talking about how Jesus is going to reign on earth for a thousand years. And then verse 7, when the thousand years are completed, Satan will be released from his prison and come to deceive and so forth. People look at that and they say, yeah, that's not what it means. Well, it says a thousand years. Yeah, yeah, but it doesn't, you know, it's just that sort of metaphorical, allegorical. So people who do study it still come to wrong conclusions. And look, Revelation is a challenging book, you know, obviously. And you need to really slow down to study. You have to study it very carefully. You have to keep cross-referencing to, there's a lot of metaphors and there's a lot of allusions. And there's a lot of symbolism. It doesn't mean that the book is all symbolic. The Lord is just trying to help us understand to those who have ears to hear and eyes to see and hearts to understand what's going to happen. I want to encourage you uh, that Skip is writing a book, just finishing now, on Revelation and commend it to you because it's going to be important to slow down and study that text very carefully. It's easier than maybe other books of the Bible to misinterpret. And once you get off track 
it takes you into all kinds of bad theology. And bad theology has bad consequences. I mean, for example, I don't know how people miss the centrality of Israel in the book of Revelation. Israel is a country. Uh, Jesus is walking around with 144,000 Jewish believers on Mount Zion. There's a temple operational. Who's going to the temple? The Gentiles? I mean, you know, there's 144,000 people, 12,000 from each tribe. They're going all over the world, you know, as, as bond servants, as witnesses for Jesus. And they come from Israel and they come from the 12 tribes. And there's a lot of Israel in there. And yet people are like, yeah, God's done with Israel. Wow. So I think you, if you don't read it, you're definitely not going to get it. <laughs> if you do read it, it doesn't mean you're going to get it. But God says, blessed are those who do read this prophecy. And what we just have to ask is, Lord, give us a, eyes to see, ears to hear, hearts to understand what you're doing. And bless us as we humbly, carefully work our way through it and keep asking, Lord, what are the action points? One last thought on the book of Revelation from my point, and then you know, this would be an area that, for you to, to comment on. I, you know, I'm intrigued with Revelation. I don't often teach on it me personally, although I love to answer questions about it, because I'm not going to be here for it. So I'm interested mostly, me personally, in what are the end times prophecies that are things that can and will lead up to the rapture of the church. So, you know, I love this stuff, and it is important. You know, I try to tell every ministry I meet with, do you have a rapture strategy? What's going to happen when you're all gone? You know, how will people know what to do then, right? I, I was with Tyndale, my publisher. Now, the, I said, you know, to so the executives there, do you guys have a rapture strategy? And they're like, a what? I said, what do you mean a what? You guys sold 65 million copies of, you know, the Left Behind series, um, and you're selling millions of my books. What's your rapture strategy? And they're like, we're believers. How can we have a rapture? I said, I hope you have some unbelievers on the staff, you know? <laughs> now, you try to lead them to the Lord. I'm not saying, but... Somebody's got to run this place, you know, and print the Bibles and teach end times prophecy when they're living through it. Now, Skip, I think, has a rapture strategy because he's got all his sermons online and he's writing a book to help people understand Revelation. That's important because when we're gone, it has to be accessible. People have to download on Kindle and download on their iPods and whatever and go, how do I understand what's going on? Because there won't be anyone around to teach it. So, um, anyway, pitch it back to you. We're coming to an end. I get to ask the final question. Okay. And uh, Joel, you talked a little bit about replacement theology today, and you brought it up as a concern. I want to talk about or have you address what would be the opposite end of the spectrum, but an equally dangerous doctrinal problem, and that's dual covenant theology. It's the idea that Jews don't need to trust Jesus as Messiah because God made an everlasting covenant with them. So that's a done deal. Gentiles do, but Jews don't. Talk about that, because that's also a huge problem, and it's becoming prevalent in churches. It certainly is. Um, and this is, yeah, you're right. That's a great way to frame it, Skip. Is It's bad enough that you got some people who say they're Christians, and particularly Christian leaders, who say God's done with the Jews. Then at that other end, you got people saying, yeah, God loves the Jews so much, they don't even need Jesus. And you're like, wow, wow. Because at the heart of that, though it's probably misguided at both places, the result is anti-Semitic. To say that God's done with the Jews, that they have no hope, that God has no plan and purpose for them, that's anti-Semitism. They may not mean it to be that, but that's the effect. That was Luther's effect. Not only is God done with the Jews, but we should be done with them too and take action. And while he never took action that I'm personally aware of, Hitler picked up on his theology and implemented the final solution. But at the other end, people who say, oh, we love the Jews, we want to bless the Jews, but no, they don't need Jesus. They've got their own special deal with God. That's anti-Semitic too, because you don't want to bless people into hell. I know that sounds so provocative to say, but listen, I believe because of the scriptures that m my family and I would go to hell and perish in the hellfires forever and ever and ever unless some Gentile people loved us and shared with us the gospel of Jesus Christ. There's no scriptural case for Jews not needing Jesus. Think of Acts chapter 2 
where Peter's giving the first sermon filled with the Spirit on Pentecost. What does he say? Verse 36 of chapter 2 of Acts. Therefore, let all the house of Israel know for certain that God has made him Lord and Messiah, this Jesus whom you crucified. And then people say, well, what should we do? Who is asking that question? Presbyterians? <laughs> Episcopalians? Evangelicals? No, these were Jewish people in Jerusalem saying, what do we do with that message? And he doesn't say, oh, I'm sorry, you're all Jews, right? Well, you don't need this. Well, I'm sorry, I thought I was in Rome. I thought I was in you know, Moscow. I thought I was in Albuquerque. Yeah. <laughs> I don't, I'm a little confused. So much has happened in the last couple of hours. I, no, 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 you choose, you don't. No, he says, repent, each of you, and be baptized in the name of Jesus the Messiah for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Listen, it's a very sensitive topic within Judaism, but it's a more sensitive topic with Jesus. Jesus came to be the Messiah. He is the Messiah. He proved it by dying on the cross and rising again. And we, we are supposed to love people and bless people unconditionally. When we do the Joshua work, we do not say, listen, if you'll accept Jesus, we'll provide food. If you will accept this Bible from us, you'll get relief supplies. No, we do not do this. We do unconditional love. We care for people regardless of whether they ever believe in Jesus, whether even they ever even want to hear about Jesus. Why? Because that's what Jesus did. When he fed 5,000 up in Galilee, he didn't say, listen, if you're going to follow me forever, you get in this line, you get your chow. But if you're not going to follow me, I'm sorry, you get in this line, you get bupkis. When he healed the 10 lepers, right? He didn't say, all right, you know, if you're going to follow me and bow down and worship me, I will heal you. So you just, you know, come just as you are. No, he just healed them. And then only one of them came back and worshiped him. Now, did Jesus want Jewish people and Gentile people to worship him? Of course he did. Did he make his love conditional on whether they would or not? He did not. And that's our model. Now, I'm a Rosenberg. I would not be going to heaven unless I'd received Jesus as the Messiah. There's no other name on earth or under heaven by which any of us can be saved. We have to be gentle. We have to be loving. We, it's not about, you know, getting in people's faces. It's about loving people. But being honest, this is true. And not only is it true, it's good news. I'm not ashamed of the gospel. It's the only power of salvation, first for the Jew, and then for Gentiles. And, but I'm watching a lot of evangelicals, Skip, I think you are seeing it too, who are, feel so sensitive about not wanting to offend Jewish people and wanting to be a blessing to Israel as a nation, to Jews in general, that they're really doing theological pretzel twists to say, oh, no, you, you don't really, I don't, I, you know, listen, listen. This is, it's probably coming from a heart of, well, sensitivity, but, there's a trace of shame there. This is good news. It's not bad news that we're like, oh, I'm sorry, you gotta take your medicine. This is hope. This is peace. This is game-changing, life-changing stuff. And we don't, we, look, not everyone's gonna love us for saying it. We need to say it lovingly, gently, humbly. Not everyone's gonna accept it, and we should accept them who don't accept it. But to back away now, when the world wants to literally annihilate the Jewish people, or the Islamic, radical Islamic world does, and the rest of the world doesn't seem to care, this is not a good time for us to be fearful, shameful about the gospel of Jesus, the Messiah. Because we're going to stand before a Jewish Messiah one day, and he's going to say, hey, <laughs> why did you not ever love my Jewish people? Why didn't you love them unconditionally? Why didn't you care for them? Why didn't you stand for them when they were being persecuted? Why didn't you tell them about Jesus? You know, 90 to 95% of Jews who come to faith in Jesus come to faith through the love of Gentiles. My family did, and I'm grateful for that little church and that little community in little upstate New York community that never said, oh, they're Rosenbergs. We can't tell them about Jesus. We can't invite them to a Bible study or take them to Sunday school clues. I'm not, I didn't like Sunday school and I didn't like vacation Bible school, but I'm very grateful for those who loved me and didn't go, oh, he's Jewish. Uh, he's not going to be interested. He doesn't need this. Thank God they didn't think that way. Well, we would say amen to that, Joel. Thank you for coming and being with us this weekend. 
Thank you for listening to Inside the Epicenter with Joel Rosenberg. If you'd like to learn more about the Joshua Fund, visit our website, joshuafund.com. And there you can learn about what we're doing in the Middle East to bless Israel and her neighbors in the name of Jesus, and how you can participate in the healing work we're doing in this critical region. For Joel Rosenberg, I'm Carl Muller, and thank you for listening to Inside the Epicenter.